take up any more of that time than I need to. I just have a few remarks to make. First of all, again, welcome. Um, please do keep chatting away in the chat. Uh, that's part of the fun of the virtual programming uh, situation that we've all gotten so accustomed to over the past two years. Um, but if you have a question for the Q&A that we're going to be doing toward the end of the program, if you could do me the favor of rather than put, no, no, excuse me, posting that in the chat, if you could put it in the Q&A section that says ask a question. Somebody's already posted something there, so um, you should be able to find that pretty easily. So put your question down there and know that you can look and see what other people have asked. And if you have the same question, you can upvote it and that moves it up to the top of the pile. So we'll get to those toward the end of the program. Uh, tonight's moderator, uh, Jacques Lamar, my colleague and friend, has just posted again in the chat a link by which you can purchase your very own signed copy of Sentence, the book that we're speaking about tonight. Um, now, we're no dummies at the Mark Twain House. We know that you can purchase copies of this book elsewhere. But do know that if you make a purchase through that link, you not only get a signed copy, which is not very common, but also you have the benefit of knowing that your purchase supports the Mark Twain House and Museum, which uh, is very much appreciated. And Daniel says, yes, I personally signed these copies. Um, and he did. Uh, talk about supporting the Mark Twain House. I'd like to ask you to draw your attention to the long green button under my face that says your support is vital. Click here to donate to the Mark Twain House and Museum. You know, we and everybody else, we've been doing this for almost two years now. Uh, the museum uh, officially uh, closed, we thought, for just a couple weeks on March 13 of 2020. Hard to even say that out loud. Um, it doesn't seem possible. Uh, we mounted our first virtual program just a few weeks later uh, in April, early April. And we've been doing it ever since, often as many as two or three a week. Um, and we've been really happy to remain engaged with our audience and connected with people like yourself um, throughout the past trying two years. And almost never uh, does the Mark Twain House um, charge a registration fee or an admission fee for these virtual programs. But you should know that they're not free uh, for the museum to put on. So if you've gotten any um, pleasure or enjoyment or value out of the virtual programming, if you would consider um, supporting that effort by making a donation of any size by clicking that green button, I'd like to guarantee you that every single penny is very much appreciated by the board and the staff of the museum, and every single penny is put to very, very good use indeed. So having said that, I want to talk about other support. Um, tonight's program, like all of our virtual programs, is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by Connecticut Public, WNPR, our media sponsor. It's also produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, who was a beloved um, trustee of the museum who passed away last year. And the museum is delighted to honor his legacy and his memory through this virtual programming. Uh, if you enjoy this program and want more, please visit marktwainhouse.org where you can see a full list of upcoming programs, including some that will be offered live and in person at the museum in Hartford, Connecticut, um, and a whole raft of, of uh, other virtual programs. Also know that this program tonight is being recorded as all the virtual programs are. It will be posted on the website and you can access it simply by uh, following the link that you got used to get here tonight. And one fun thing is that the chat remains live in perpetuity, so you can come back and chat with people if you've made a friend uh, this evening. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests. Jacques Lamar, again, is a dear friend of the museum. He's a playwright. He lives here in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and we're delighted to have him here in conversation with Daniel Jenis, who's a son of Russian immigrants who came to the USA in 1977. He was born the following year. His father is Alexander Jenis, a well-known Russian public intellectual and author. Daniel attended Stuyvesant High School and NYU, graduating in 1999. He began a career in publishing at the same time as selling blow and getting hooked on dope. He also read the entire corpus of writing from antiquity and was well into the Middle Ages when narcotics interfered. After a very desperate summer week in 2003, he was convicted of five counts of robbery and sent to prison for 10 years. 
his time in maximum security as a New Yorker reading smarty pants and prison yard weightlifter was good fodder for a journalistic career and the memoir Sentence, 10 Years and a Thousand Books in pres Prison. Excuse me. Today, he's been free and clean since his release in 2014, and he lives with his wife, Petrus Albo, in Brooklyn, New York. So I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a great big Mark Twain House welcome to Dennis and Jacques. Let me just make a few clicks to bring everybody back on screen. I'm back. You're back and getting Jacques back up. I think we might have lost Jacques video. He mentioned, he says here that his screen was frozen. All right, so welcome, Dennis. We'll wait. We'll give Jacques a moment to. Uh, uh, he's uh, back he too he's now. Back now. Let's see. There. All right, and here we go. That's no, not him. Let's, I'm, there you go. That's not me. Hi. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> my apologies, All right. everyone. Well, my screen was, was frozen. I couldn't see Jennifer. Uh, Daniel, uh, you can't well, see me now. A tragedy. Oh, I can see you. Believe me, I, I can. See okay, you. terrific, terrific. I apologize for that delay, folks. Um, and we're These going to happen, uh, hopefully but thank you. edit we're this because tonight's uh, program is going to be shared uh, later on C-SPAN uh, on the book channel. So everyone on your best behavior. Um, and speaking <laughs> of good behavior, Daniel. Yes. Congrat <laughs> congratulations on your, uh, on your new book. Um, thank you. And, thank you very uh, much. Uh, must have been uh, quite a quite an undertaking to to write, but um, such an undertaking to to have lived through. And um, uh, before we started, I asked if you would be um, would be willing to actually read from the very very end of your book. Um, I think we all know. Spoiler alert: uh, you made it through your your time in prison but i think it would be instructive for people oh okay that i'm sorry 10. i thought i was getting no, your 10 was... i thought those were jazz hands all right <laughs> no. uh no okay all right so um if you could if you could read from yes. uh, the chronology at the end of the book so that would be well, i think oddly a great place for us to start what 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 jack is suggesting is very very wise very very smart it's to give a, uh, some context to all the uh the, the graphic and, and and filthy anecdotes that we're going to be uh discussing to give them a bit of factual context which is something that that the book itself doesn't exactly do the book is written in ch 20 chapters but they're not um a story, you know, to, to today I did this, tomorrow I did that. They're, they're not linear like that. The chapters are thematic. Uh, however, to make sure that people got an idea, here's a, a chronology of my time, and it's a, a fairly compact way to do it. So let me just re read. So I was arrested on, on November 13th, 2003, which seems like uh, forever ago, but to me, see, for, for many years, that seemed like yesterday. November 13th, 2003, and bounced between the Manhattan Robbery Squad headquarters on 11th Street, right next to where I misspent my youth learning to play eight ball at the long shuttered pool hall Lake Q, and central booking called the Tombs, where my bail was set at $150,000. Very high bail. Followed by my eventual conviction seven months later. Uh, and that compelled the movement, which I'm about to describe, because uh, from here, now we're going to have a list of 11 different facilities. So my first prison was Rikers Island, November 2003, followed by Downstate Correctional Facility. That's what I usually call like the sorting hat. If you know your Harry Potter, that's where they decide where you're mm -hmm. going to go. Although I think all of us went to Slytherin, basically. But uh, downstate, <laughs> I, I, I left downstate. I got the downstate in uh, May of 2004, and I was in Greenhaven Correctional Facility by June of 2004. Greenhaven is a place for lifers. Everybody there except for me was never getting out. But I had a good four years there. So I left Greenhaven and went to Eastern uh, Correctional Facility in September of 2007. 
and uh, Eastern is considered a very nice prison. Then upstate uh, SHU, that's uh, solitary confinement in uh, October of 2009. Then Coxsackie Correctional Facility. That's really the name of the place. That's not some kind of awful nickname. It's actually called Coxsackie. I was there in March of 2010. And thank God I only spent four months there. I got to green SHU by July of 2010 because it was a very violent and bad place. And from green SHU, I went to Five Points Correctional Facility uh, in October of 2010. And from there, I finally descended from the maxes to the mediums and went to Cayuga Correctional Facility on uh, September of 2011. F from Cayuga, I went to Lakeview Shoe, which was an awful place on Lake Erie in uh, February of 2012. And from there, I went to a perfectly lovely pr prison called Groveland Correctional Facility in uh, March of 2012. Then. I went to Fishkill, my last prison, in uh, August of 2013. I got there on my birthday and nobody knew me. It was really sad. And then it all ended on February 20th, 2014, when they actually let me into the parking lot of Fishkill. And I got into a Volkswagen that my, my parents had. And so, take it home. That's... Uh... It's really astonishing, I think, for people who are not familiar with the criminal justice systems once people are, are cycled into it, to know that that you are shuttled around so much. Yeah. Is, is uh, there a, what's the log is there a logic behind it? Abso absolutely. Behind absolutely. It? Now the longest I stayed in one prison was uh four years in, in Greenhaven. Uh but Pretty much everybody tries to stay in their prison as long as they can. Uh, there's certain things you can do to, to help that along. Medical hold, or if you're in a certain program, like a welding program, that'll keep you there until you're done with the welding program. But in reality, they, they move you around so that you don't get too comfortable, so that so that you, you don't establish a, a base of operations, you don't make best friends with the guards and then escape from Clinton like those two guys did in 2015. It's it's to keep it's to keep you off balance. And the the movements, there's there's a chapter in my in the book called uh, Greyhounds to Hell because uh, they, the, they have a fleet of old Greyhound buses which they use to move prisoners. They look really nice on the outside and they're really in, 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 infernally bad on the inside. Uh, they move prisoners around all week. There's always probably about 5% of New York State prisoners at any given day they're on the road except for the days when they don't do movements at all, which are like, I believe Wednesday is no movement and definitely Saturday and Sunday. Um, but, but, but yeah. Um, um, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, it, the, the movements are an awful thing because you accumulate property. And when you leave, it used to be in the past that you could pay to move your property. Now, most prisoners don't have any money, but, uh, at, at, at this point, you can't even pay to have more than four draft bags of property. Four bags might seem like a, a, a lot, but this is like your entire, all your possessions. And prisoners do accumulate magazines and old clothes and everything has a little bit of value in prison. And plus there's mm -hmm. your food. Your food is your wealth. It's your, it's your savings account. You know, yeah. I mean, cigarettes are the true wealth, but they don't take up that much room. But your food is valuable, too. So four bags is all you're allowed to bring with you. So whenever uh, an old timer gets moved from the prison, it's Christmas from the guys for the guys who live next to him. For, yeah. for anybody <laughs> who lives on either side. I mean, I inherited a whole collection of porn that way. Um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and when, when I moved, I left all my cooking pots to another guy. These things are worth their, their weight in gold because you can't get a, an aluminum wok. It has to be yeah. know, smuggled. In. So let's, let's go before, before we get you on the, on the buses, the greyhounds to hell. Um, let's talk about your, your life, uh, before, um, before getting arrested, Oh. Um, because I think that that plays very heavily into um, 
into the kind of person you become in prison. Uh, but I think also, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's obviously something we want to talk about because of where we are in the world right now. And so if you could talk a little bit about your family. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm, uh, I used to always just blatantly say I'm a, I'm Russian because at home I, uh, you know, we always spoke Russian, ate Russian food. My parents emigrated from the USSR in 1977, but, uh, after after what happened a week ago, I, I don't feel so Russian anymore. By blood, I'm Ukrainian. Uh, I'm I'm seventy five percent Ukrainian ethnically, whatever that whatever that means. My my grandparents came from there, and uh, with the rest being you know pure pure good old fashioned Jewish blood. But um, so even though I'm Ukrainian by blood, I don't speak a word of U Ukrainian. It's it, but I can understand it easily my mm -hmm. sympathies are are obviously with um kiev you know and uh it's 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 become... did you did your father leave of his own volition was it uh, or was he fleeing he was he definitely was fleeing he my father was unable to 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 uh, um even he was the best student in his in his little university in latvia in riga but he couldn't go to a uh, university in st petersburg in leningrad because there was a, a a military officer's daughter who got his place and my father was a jew and uh basically his career was to be he was, was going to end up a, a teacher at a second rate agricultural college he wanted to become a writer and uh you know my grandfather had already lost everything twice because because of uh stalin's um doctor's purge which was about to happen mm -hmm. then stalin died and my grandfather survived and then my grandfather's best friend defected to london in 1974 and that the family lost everything again that we had built up everything mm -hmm. again 20 years after stalin's death and then it all it all came crashing down again because because of the the friend who ran away uh, to London and, and uh, it was just not wor not working out for the family of the Soviet Union. No one had any hope, mm -hmm. any jobs. You know that whole generation was, was was hopeless. And if you look at the literature of of the time, um, you'll, you'll you'll see a, a lot a lot of that. And I, I was very lucky. Uh, you mentioned my back, my background, because my father came to America as as a budding writer. I got to see some of the best and meet some of the the, the best writers in Russian who who existed through that time period. Sergei Dovlatov, who Russian speakers will know who that is. I mean, he he knew he was in my house so much. He gave me a little plastic gun and scared my mother to death with that. You know, uh, I knew I met Joseph Bronsky. I, I met all kinds kinds of anybody who was big in the Soviet world, pretty much except for Solzhenitsyn, I, I, I met as a, as a, you know, a young kid. Um, although Solzhenitsyn, I obviously got to know much better through the written world word later on mm. because I ended up. Yeah. Reading. I want to get into the books a little bit later. Cause it, uh, yes, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a part of the book. It's not as big a part of the book as I was expecting that I've heard, I I've heard that before. Yes. And it's not a disappointment. It's not a criticism. But well, I think that it's, that's kind of you to say. Not everyone feels that way. But yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, but again, I think we can I want to get into that a little bit later. I think, you know, one of the things about criminal justice in the U.S. and uh, is, you know, is how it oftentimes, you know, is weighted against people of color, ah. uh, people of lower education, of lower means. And here you are a person of, uh, okay. you know, who would seem destined to not cross that threshold. And I think also with the, you know, the, the weight of being a child of an immigrant, of immigrants also probably placed a, a special burden on you. So let's talk about that. Well, okay. So the, let's talk about what I went to prison for. I mean, we we didn't actually mm -hmm. talk about that because uh, isn't that the, the first question everybody has when they hear you've been to prison? They want to know what it was for. And as everybody knows, it was for rape. Oh, no, right? Not for no. rape. <laughs> right. Big, 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 big difference, right? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, I did know people who who were in prison for rape and their life was over. They When they were getting out, they had nothing to look forward to. 
because being a sex offender and registered and, and all that you don't have you can't do anything you can't park a car in front of a school but yeah. that's not my my i my was su- i was surprised about the internal politics surrounding sex offenses Ooh, it's, I assumed it's hard that to it be a sex bad offender. for for pedophiles but for for um rapists of, of adults it, they're still ostracized within the prison system. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, even even those who commit violence against women are often bullied and abused. Uh, sometimes these are these are often just excuses. But but getting back to mm-hmm. why I went to prison, uh, I was I became a heroin addict. Very very, I was very predisposed. I had alcoholism running in my family, and I had tried different drugs on my way through school, through high school, and through through college. And uh, you know, the the stronger the drug, it seemed like the more I liked it. And I tried heroin, and within a, a very short amount of time, I was I mean really addicted. Hundred dollars a day, had to have it. And um, in the summer of two thousand three. I uh, ran through a five thousand dollar Visa card. What idiot gave me this credit card? I don't know, but that person who uh, who decided I was a good risk to get five thousand dollars of credit, which I took all out in cash advances, uh, that person left me with a huge habit. And uh, the day that card ran out, my uh, withdrawal set in. Because I couldn't, mm. I had no more money. I, you know, my parents had, had enough of me. I wasn't living at at, at home. Uh, my my, I was just had gotten married actually, and, and and she was didn't understand what was happening to me, what was wrong, and um, I got really really desperate, and I I did something that was completely against my own my own morals and my own common sense. I committed uh, armed robbery. Uh, now. It sounds worse than what it really was. What what really happened is I I, I I showed a camping knife to people. I said, I'm very sorry to do this. I'm I'm I really have an emergency. Can I please have your your your, your money? It's, and usually the people told me to they curse at me and tell me to get out of here and I'd run away. But five times they didn't. Five times they gave me the money. So I was and this guilty. this earned you the sobriquet of the apologetic bandit. That's apologetic that's what I was bandit. called in the in the press, and that's what I was even called in the courtroom. And as uh, as mitigating as that sounds, it did me no good in court. It did not help me to be the apologetic bandit. And I'll explain. You know, you, you had mentioned earlier about, about uh, the reg, the usual suspects, kind of who who winds up going to prison for violent crimes. I did not come from that demographic. It was very clear yeah. to everybody involved that that being I had just graduated NYU uh, two and a half years before. You know, my family was sitting in the courtroom horrified at all this. I had both my parents um, and and they could, you know, I just I, I was out of place. And uh, somehow that turned into me getting the absolute maximum. I was I was given two years for every count of armed robbery, which means I was given 12 flat. But you get good behavior. So with good behavior, two years comes off. So you, so my mm-hmm. sentence was 10 years and three months divided into the five counts of armed robbery. That's two years each. So two years for every time I scared somebody at night on, in August of 2003. And uh, yeah. what can I say except I, I, I'm sorry. You know, I, I don't make any excuses for it, I, I only apologize because it's very shameful. It's, I feel this awful is why you're the this. apologetic bandit. Yeah, I, I, it is. It is, but but it, but honestly, it it is something to be ashamed of. I mean, I scared people. There's people yeah. who are going to remember me for the rest of their lives as somebody who came to them at night and demanded money from them. I mean, I I, yeah. I have been in that position. I, I've been mugged, and I know it's awful. No one likes it. Nobody nobody could possibly like it, no matter how apologetic the bandit is. Um, now we we have a lot to horse race through now. Sure, you have ten years of your life. Uh, we 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 haven't even gotten to you so actually being arrested. So, so, so we're gonna we're we're gonna leave some mystery for the book. Yes, of course. Uh, and and but what, what you want encourage. what you want to know is, is is how did a a person from my background fit in 
in a, a world that was so unknown and uh, different from my, from the one I knew. But perhaps I, that's I think that, and also I think the one of the things that's that's most fascinating about your book is about the identity politics of prisons. Sure, sure, it's and it's, the it's social deep. strata and. It's very deep and it, it covers several chapters in different ways. So let's talk a little bit about that, what it, what it meant for you to be a Russian Jew in the New York penal system, where that put you in the pecking order of things. And there's a pecking order within the pecking order too. Absol but absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, everybody knew that I didn't fit in from the moment I said one word. From the moment I spoke, they could tell that I did not run the streets through my my youth they knew that i was somebody who had been in in, in an educational i had an education educated background uh then later on when they heard me do things like like speak in french or speak in russian on the phone uh all this stuff made me really out of place for 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 a lot of the guys there who who uh just didn't quite know what to make of me and I was put into a position very quickly of having to decide whether I'm going to to be myself and hope that these guys like like me anyway, even, even though we don't have too much in common, or if I'm going to try and fit in. Like I could easily, I could say, yeah, well, I, I'm I'm into Harley Davidsons and pit bulls, and man, I wish I had a a, a Tech Nine gun and, and and all this. I I mean, I knew the lingo well enough. I I listened. I I pick, I could mm -hmm. pick up on it, but I knew that if I tried that, no matter how perfectly I hit the right words, I just didn't have my heart wasn't in it, and they would have they would have known that I was faking it and lying to them. And it would have been much worse for me to be known as a fraud uh, rather than to be known as the fish out of water, but a friendly fish. Yeah. You know, because what was I, the word that gave you up? <laughs> uh, there, what was there, the word that blew your cover? Well, I used to say it was, it was the P words, uh, either either mentioning a uh -huh. passport or Paris or my uh, my papa. I mean, nobody, nobody celebrated Father's Day in prison. So you, you, you asked um, about pecking orders and, and where I came in. So uh, first of all, I'm white, right? Uh, that puts me in an immediate minority. There are fewer Asians than there are whites. But of course, in, in prison, it's, it's a reverse of the uh, American uh American demography. Yeah. yeah, demography. Yeah. It's totally reversed. There's a majority of African-Americans. A secondary majority of, uh, you know, the second place is, is Hispanics, third place is, is whites, and fourth is, is Asians and everybody else. Uh, so the, the, the white population when I, during my time was 21%. That, I learned that later from looking it up as a journalist, but it was approximately 21% of the prison population was white. And mm -hmm. this population did not come from NYU uh, like I did. It came from the... Um, from the trailer parks, it came. It came. It came from upstate New York, where 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 there were a lot of poorer people, a lot of people with drug problems. Uh, so a lot of a lot of country music and bad tattoos. If that makes any sense, I don't. <laughs> now, I, one of the things that you, one of the things that you, um, that I think that you make clear, is that despite your education you don't perceive a superiority to oh. your fellow inmates. And what? I think also one of the things that's, that's interesting is that you not only take ownership for why you were there, but that there is that you see a degree of responsibility for the majority of the people that are in the prisons. Of, being of, I mean, behind walls. Of, of course, everybody pretty much, Almost everybody in the prison is there because drugs are illegal. If, if, if drugs, if drugs were legal, the, the prisons would just be empty, and there'd be a few people there who are just so violent that they can't be kept anywhere else. But ninety nine percent of the prison would would if, you know would be on drugs outside in the world. But what you said about uh, superiority and inferiority, the truth is, is that having come to another world, I had everything to learn from 
my 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 fellow man there and uh i did teach as much as i could there are lots a lot of ex-prisoners who are now know how to you know read a short story because of me and who wrote their first love letter because because of me i did my best to, to teach but i also learned and you know if you if you open the book and you look at the dedication it's dedicated to to my wife for waiting for me for all these these years these years how could i not but it's also dedicated to the prisoners of New York State for teaching me because I learned to do so much from them that I could never, never have picked up on my own, whether it was cooking or or making armor out of New Yorker magazines or making a knife out of a tin can. You know, I, I, I had to learn from from people who had, you know, left school at third grade. And uh, yeah. didn't see I, I, was wrong a, I was astounded by the ingenuity absolutely the ingenuity of these uh, of the population in the prisons when the deprivation is so severe at that's, how that's... they you know how they figure out not just like how to get some of the common necessities of life but like the whole ec prison economy it's and, such a credit to man first of all the fact it, it made me feel so proud of, of, of mankind when i saw that they were running a gambling ticket inside the uh single uh shu special housing unit which is solitary confinement they were running a gambling ticket that was uh there were little strings that would pass under the doors of every every cell and little notes on them and through this a payment system was done through the people outside who would you know and and people would put bets on games and then listen on the radio you know these were football games they hadn't they had no idea what they looked like but they would gamble on them and if they won Right, they would get paid through the same conveyor belt of of dental floss that would come through the uh, through the bottoms of these doors. It was just amazing. Um, that's why the, my chapter on solitary confinement is actually the longest one in the book because I saw so much that people did under most incredible limitations, very cruel limitations too. Limitations meant to stop people just from conversing from, from from just from normal human stuff you know but they figured out how to do it they figured out how to get in touch with each other and i also came to really believe in in in, in uh the invisible hand of the market because in prison there's not supposed to be uh transactions i went to the box for buying five human souls that was one of my that was my yes. first publication. I'm I'm quite well well known for that story, uh, and the reason why they found me guilty was because I had given away five cups of coffee. That was that was the technical reason for my guilt. So transactions in prison are forbidden, and yet this is totally not the case. People, you know, buy and sell things all day long. They buy and sell services with packs of cigarettes. You can buy. Um, you can buy a back rub. Uh, I mean, you could buy a blowjob. Uh, you, you, could, you, could, you could buy mm -hmm. all any kind of service that one man can do for another, whether it's a haircut, a tattoo, something sexual, something that's th therapeutic, like like massage. A lot of guys were bodybuilders, and they they would they would spend on on. on a, there was one mm -hmm. guy who claimed he was a chiropractor. I don't know if he really was, but he seemed to do a good job. So. Uh, you know, and, and then, you know, the things you could buy, like, and, and this has been going on for time immemorial. I mean, in, in uh, Dostoevsky mentions in House of the Dead, how how the guy guys were carving chess sets to sell to him. And I read that very phrase at the exact moment when there was a man in the cell next to my own using his spit to make paper mache chess pieces to sell to me. Which I didn't want at all. I didn't want these damn spit <laughs> chess pieces, but uh, he kind of forced me into it by making them and then saying, "I thought you wanted them," you know. Um, but you know, you, you you read about these things that people can buy. Apparently, in the seventies, there were there were bullets uh, available in prison that people would use with uh, uh, an antenna to it, it for 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 fights, zip guns, you know. Yeah. You, you know there. Yeah, there was, I Yes, the, you know, the different ways that people contrive to be able to feed their addiction. 
Ah, in prison yes. is 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 pretty amazing. Um, you know, for someone who's not familiar, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to give away too many surprises on how it gets into the prison, but <laughs> the prison talk about wallet. that, especially as a person who is an addict in the prison. Yeah, I, I, I had um, my problems with addiction continued through through pretty much the first four years. Of, of my 10 years in after, after that, I, I, it finally kind of hit me that, that, that I can't even mess around. I, I can't even, you know, reward myself on new year's Eve, nothing, uh, because you get in trouble really easily. You get caught with a dirty urine, you get 90 days in the box. And yet plenty of people in prison didn't care. They were willing to take that risk because they were wanting to get high as much as they possibly could because they didn't want to be in prison. They didn't want to have the sensation of being in prison. So they looked for any other sensation, whether it was uh, smoking pot, which stays in your system forever or, or do, doing, doing the dope. And um, you know, you were mentioning about how things get in the prison. If prison wanted to, if prison authorities wanted to end the drug trade, which they don't, because for them, as long as the most of the prisoners are so active and putting together, by the way, a bag of dope that costs ten dollars in New York City costs fifty dollars in prison, and nobody in prison makes any money. You only make ten cents an hour, so it, it, it's it's really really hard to to manage drug addiction. And yet, people have full time uh, opiate habits. Uh, a lot of it is done through the medication window. When they have guys who are on cancer treatment, getting morphine, um, you, you know, uh, so, so more oxycontin and morphine are available for much less than the, he the heroin because they come out. They're pills that come out of someone's mouth. They get cheap and then, and then, then you buy it, and uh, yeah. it sounds, sounds disgusting, right? But uh, yeah. I, 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 I got over the disgust. And, and, and your your I, book, I your book, sure, you know, has its share of disgusting, but it's also got moments. Um, like let, let's talk about your your neighbor um, early on in the book. Um, it's hard to tell because the book is not chronological, but I think he was probably pretty early on in your stay. Uh, the Muslim gentleman, the one who, who saved you had me. Conversation. Yes, that was yes. in my fourth year, or so my third or fourth year. Majid, yes. Oh, he was a wonderful man, very intelligent man. He was the only real political prisoner I ever, I ever met. I mean, he was in prison for a crime that wasn't a political crime. He was in prison for murder, but the the murder was committed as part of the of the BLA, the Black Liberation Army. They they had robbed a, a, a bank and they ended up killing the cops who who who, who were after them. And he knew he was going to die in prison. He, 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 you know, he, he knew it and inside of prison, he was really well respected and he had been educated before he, he had gone to university before this happened. And in prison, he just continued his, his education. And I lived right next to him by coincidence, by luck. And this turned out to be a wonderful thing for me because when, when, when I put my foot in my mouth once and, and said something, something stupid, it's very, people are very sensitive in prison. People, people are really walking around looking for an argument because, you know, sometimes when you have nothing else but the capacity to, to win a fight, you know, that's, that's what you, what you do. A lot of angry people mm -hmm. in prison. And, uh, when I, I said the, 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 made the wrong joke, which was totally my, my fault. And, uh, he's, you know, for, for a while I thought I was going to get killed and then it just all ended one day. And I was so afraid that he would find out because, because I was ashamed of myself and, uh, he was my friend and I didn't want to insult him. And then it turned out that he was the one who told who told everybody to back off. He knew from the beginning. They had ran and told him first of all because he was the Muslim head of security. That's a position amongst the jailhouse Muslims. He knew from the moment it happened. He just well, let me stew in it for for a few days to to make me feel mm -hmm. it, and then and and then uh, told him to to back off. That I'm not a bad guy. I'm just I'm just have a stupid mouth. I have a bad sense of humor. I'm not bad. Too 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 much. I'm, I talk too much. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it happens with people like me. So, uh, you know, he was a great person to, to have known. And I know that there's others like that. But when I, when I before going to prison, I expected to, to meet a world, even when I was on Rikers Island, I expected to meet a world of like the Napoleons of crime. 
you know, experts. Because I used to I used to read these books by Andrew Vox. Ever hear of him? He was a, yeah. a writer. He was a writer who he died in December of of last year, and he wrote about vigilantes who had met each other in prison, and then they would go after pedophiles and kill them. That was his. It was a really kind of a very very niche. Uh, thing, but he would. Yeah. He was really popular in prison because his heroes were ex-cons and cons convicts, and mm -hmm. they were not. They were not good guys. And prisoners ate that up. They loved it. Yeah. And Andrew Vox actually kept things fresh. He kept the details accurate by corresponding with prisoners. And I, I had a, a friend, Philip, Philip Rubin, very intelligent man who was serving so much time in prison. It's horrible. But Andrew Vox corresponded with him and would, would ask him, you know, for the details and the details would turn up in later books. Yes. Mm. And that, and, and he died, but Philip Rubin well, is still with us. We are, him. um, we're going to be running a little over maybe cause I want to, we haven't even gotten to the books yet. And let's I, talk so about I, the books. It, it, if if I don't get another opportunity, I can't tell you that there is so much more to this book uh, than we're going to be able to scratch tonight. Um, so the your reading list is so incredibly diverse and dense. Um, ah, it's actually even denser than you think. It's uh, a lot of it got only, cut out. <laughs> only lacking in Mark Twain, but the the and, and we'll fix that shame later but i think you know to me one of the things is how did you get these books well my family and what was, was your very role in the prison me. literary system absolutely okay so th these are three questions and i'll i'll answer so first of all my family uh provided me with a lot a lot of books uh a lot of the time books in in russian i always ask for books in russian and french to keep up my other languages because otherwise I'd, I'd forget, especially the French, which was never that solid to begin with. But my Russian was good, so my father would always send me uh, books in, in English and Russian. And then there was one prison where the Russian books st stopped arriving. For, for months, I didn't get any Russian books, and I would ask, and they would tell me, shut up, shut up, there's nothing wrong. And finally, I found out they said, of course you're not getting your books in Russian. They, you can't get books in Russian. They're being sent to Albany to be translated. I said, what? To be translated? You're, and this was like Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Chekhov, you know, all the, all the classics that are this thick each. So they're being sent mm -hmm. to Albany to be translated. I mean, obviously somebody, you know, different package rooms are different. I had gotten my books in 11 other facilities, but in that particular facility, the guy saw books with Cyrillic writing. He thought it was, maybe he thought it was Putin writing to me and telling telling me yeah. how, you know, where to invade next. Uh, Georgia, you know, U Ukraine, who, who knows? Uh, but my, um, this ended, this ended well for me. When they acknowledged, I said, I wrote to Albany and asked them, can I have my books? And they had to acknowledge that they threw them out. They weren't going to translate these books. Who would who, imagine how much it would cost? You know. <laughs> so I told them that the books were worth a fortune. They're forty dollars each, and they had lost seven of them. So I actually got paid all the money. I got, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I so I, you know, I, I won in, the, in that one time, you know, in but, that one instance. But like you know, when you're in the shoe, I think at one point you read like a seventeen hundred page novel. Yes, well, I read several seventeen hundred page novels. Because you, if you mean uh, Thomas Musil's *Man Without Qualities*, or you mean mm -hmm. uh, James Joyce's *Ulysses*, or you might you're probably talking about about Proust, which I'd be now. Now you're just showing to. off. <laughs> well, no, the Proust plays a major role. I mean, it played a major role in my in, in my book and really in my in my mm -hmm. life. And I'd be happy to talk talk about the Proust. Let me just mention a few other things about about the reading. I also worked in the libraries. I worked in four prison libraries, and I felt it was my job to get guys to read because they were looking for pornography, basically. There were so many times mm -hmm. they would come looking for true crime, 
And when I realized that they were looking for accounts of rape, I, I was like, oh, no, I don't want to give this stuff out. I don't, I don't want to deal with this. Especially, you get to know what was happening when the same guy would come for the, for the same 200-page book over and over. Like, how many times mm -hmm. is he going to read that? You know, it's then you know that he's coming for, for one-handed reading. And they were all yeah. westerns. Something which, uh, you know, Mark Twain, didn't he write a roughing? No. Roughing, it, roughing is, it is um it's not a western in the sense that we know westerns but it's, it's about not, his accounts out in the wild west okay close enough well, well there's modern day yeah. westerns yes. and they come in, in in 150 uh book series and i always thought that the guys who were picking up these books were like tobacco chewing upstate cowboys right but then I opened one of the cowboy books, and they were all about humping the senoritas and and and, and about these orgies to be had in, with the Navajos. I mean, what what is this? You know, I had no idea yeah. there was a world of Western themed pornography. And Mark Twain did not write in that genre. I think I he wrote. I think sure. he did one or two. I think. I think you know for the money. For the money, uh, so he has a share I, of naughtiness, but that's not it. That's not it. <laughs> the jumping frog of Cala Cala yeah. <laughs> Um But uh, I, I, I felt it was my duty to get guys to read, and uh, I would figure out what their interests were, and I would get mm -hmm. them books that 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 I knew they would enjoy, but that were legitimate, re real, real writing, not schlock. Not mass market, you know, James Patterson paperbacks. So, you know, if it was mm -hmm. the same guys who want to read about prostitution, uh, I'd, I'd get them books about Bangkok, so they would at least know, learn about Thailand and and or, or you know, I, there were there was all kinds of people whose horizons I widened as much as I could. But Jacques, about my my own reading, yes. I, um, in the very beginning of my bid, when I was bugging out and scared to death of having to serve all, all this time and losing my wife and disappointing my family, I read science fiction and fantasy. I read stuff to make my, to, to not think about the nightmare, right? But as time went on and mm -hmm. I had to, you know, take this seriously that this is my life. Like this is, this is for real. Um, so I, uh, changed my program completely. And I thought I should use these extra 10 years of edu edu as education and read all the, the hardest, longest books in the world. So I read The Life of Johnson by Boswell. I don't think there's anybody in the modern world who has time to read that one. You know, I read Lawrence Stern, the uh, Tristram Shandy. I read Vanity Fair. I read all the big old books. And then I also read some big new books, like like I read Murakami's One uh, Q eighty four. You know that's a that's a pretty pretty thick one. And David Foster Wallace, I really I loved his Infinite Chest. That was so funny. When you have uh, unlimited time to read through all those footnotes, it becomes very interesting. But out of all of those very serious door stoppers that I read, there was one that simply changed my life. And that was the one which you said I was I was showing off with the Proust. <laughs> Most people don't get a chance in life to read all seven volumes of 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 uh, in remembrance of lost time. I mean, how can you? It's three and a half pages. I imagine half, most people wouldn't have pages. read the first volume. <laughs> uh, no, but the second one's very nice. The the, the the Swan in Love. It's that one. It can go as a. It, it, it's, go on its own without the others uh and proust actually didn't have time in his lifetime to edit uh volumes five and six so they're very rough but i got through the entire thing i had guidebooks and maps and i really i really understood it and it changed it changed my way of thinking and it gave me a reason to to, to live really because while in prison you really have to ask yourself why not just die why why even live this is a nightmare. You're, you're, every day is pain. Everything around you is built in a way to destroy you, hate you, 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 you. And your future is so not bright, you know. You got parole. You got a family that's not too excited about you getting out. You know, it's, it's very dismal. It's dismal and it's hopeless. And 
Proust describes that same sense of anime, even, even though he was not in prison himself, he was in a psychological prison of misery. And for much of those books, of, of much of um, the, the, you know, the remembrance of times, uh, things past, Proust is a memory artist where he looks for happiness in his memories of childhood because childhood can't, was very happy for him. And it was very happy for me too. And every prisoner is a memory artist. All of us prisoners, we all we all lived in our memories. I've had I've had much more sex in my memory than I've had in a bed, you know. I've had much better meals in my in, in my head than I've had in in, in restaurants. Mm -hmm. So we're all memory artists. But after spending six volumes of of, of uh, describing how good it is to live in your memory, Bruce says, "Wait, no, hold on, no, actually, that's bullshit," and. Uh, that's not that's not what is the key to life at all. In fact, being a memory artist is a sterile and worthless pursuit because it leads to nothing. And in fact, that was true. All of us prisoners living in the past were doing exactly that, a whole bunch of nothing. And so was I with my dreams of, of how wonderful it was when I was 10 before I was an addict and before I had done stupid things. So now, um, before we, show. yeah, I was just, gonna say before just we, to, we yes. switch to, oh, you want to, you want to finish your thought? Yeah, well, just quick, quickly. Proust said that, the, that mm -hmm. the, the, the key to life, what you should do instead of living, being a memory artist is to create, is to write. If you're not a writer, create something else. But I, I wrote and it gave meaning to my life. And that helped me overcome hopelessness. Thank you. Go on. <laughs> uh, sorry to have interrupted. The sure. one of the the things that's a bit jaw dropping to me at the end of the book um, is a, a that your 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 time behind walls it was a third of your life, which is a huge chunk of time, Awful. you know, even if you're a young person, uh, but that when you were leaving, there was a certain amount of grief. Absolutely. And fear. Let's talk about that. I had become comfortable and, fr and friendly. And first of all, there's a dynamic with my own family where I didn't feel welcomed home at all. And in fact, if anything, my family seemed to be afraid of me coming home and being an addict again. Uh, I, my wife had waited, which was a wonderful thing, but I craved my parents for givel and they wouldn't, they, they, they still haven't given it to me. I'm, I'm still not, a, not forgiven no matter how, how well I, I do. But, um, the people inside prison had become my family. I learned to love them with their faults and their limitations. So when I was told that it was over, that they stay here and I leave, it was very hard to come to terms with. And I shook hands with the guy cleaning the floor on the way out the door. I, I, I couldn't help it. I, I, it was hard to leave. I was afraid of leaving. I was afraid of, 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 of the harsh reception. I was waiting for my family in the parking lot. And uh, I, knew, I knew that, you know, the love that I had from the fellow prisoners was now gone to me forever. Mm. But, you know? And, uh, you know, I think we're going to go to have Jennifer come back and do Q and a, but I do want to say that there is a, a really lovely chapter about your wife who I don't know if she's lurking off camera, uh, <laughs> but deserves heroes pay for, <laughs> for sticking with you. Uh, it's, ama it, it, it's amazing because she's beautiful and accomplished and, 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 and successful. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very lucky. Yeah. Just incredibly lucky. Um, while we're waiting for Jennifer to come on, someone asked, what did you think of Ulysses? One of the, one of the several, there were several books that, that were so mind numbingly brilliant that they made me feel like I shouldn't write anything. Ulysses is one of them. The Brothers Karamazov is another one. 
and uh, Man Without Qualities by Thomas Musil and Proust. And I would have to add Kafka, uh, The Castle. Those, yeah. those five. And if you notice, they're all modernist classics. They're all from around the same time of the 20th century. Uh, or like the 20s or so, that seems to me to be to be the acme the, when when the written world word reached its absolute brilliant point. However, Finnegan's Wake, I made nothing of. I I don't I don't I don't I don't I don't, I don't get it. I don't I don't know. I mean, James Joyce. You know, I read Ulysses with two guidebooks to understand every little piece of it. Because how else could you? How else am I going to know what what slang was used in Dublin in 1914? Come on, how, I, you know the fact that they're eating a kidney in the morning. How how can you know such figure such things out? Um, but but you know I I did with the guidebooks. Uh, Finnegan's Wake apparently comes with a whole encyclopedia if you want to uh, understand it. But I, <laughs> once I got, got out, I wasn't willing to, to undergo that again, especially since there was a lot of, uh, you know, not everyone agrees on what Finnegan's Wake means. So that, that makes me suspicious about it. But uh, but Ulysses, of course, was brilliant. But I also, you know, I'm a big fan. I love Homer. I, I, I love the Iliad. And uh, notice, you know, seeing the parallels was just such so awesome for me. It was it was brilliant. It was just being in yeah. being in in the presence of genius. All right, we've got a number of questions here. I don't know if we're going to get to all of them, but we're going to have Jennifer uh, try and plow through. I am going to plow through first. I just want to say, wow, fascinating, and I'm with you all the way. I love Ulysses, and I couldn't get anywhere with Finnegan's Wake either. So. <laughs> Having said that, um, some of the, the uh, uh, readers, uh, excuse me, readers, the, the audience um, uh, questions are really more comments. So I'm going to skip some of those. I'm also going to skip the ones that have been answered um, through the conversation. Uh, those questions were posed before uh, the questions were answered. So uh, Mark Collins just wants to know, are the books you read listed in the book? Okay. So uh, originally that was the plan for publication, but the book list that I came home with has 1467 titles in it that would have taken up as much pay as, as a, a whole second book so uh they had these ideas to put it on a website i said that's i'll do that but then they they when the book seemed to change focus to, to be more about the people and the life rather than just being literary focused uh it was it was neglected, unfortunately. So the books are not listed. I'm sorry. However, I will answer any question about any any book. I mean, I, I give me authors, and I'll tell you what I read of them. Just any anybody famous, I probably read. <laughs> maybe we'll do that in our next uh, next session with you, Daniel. Um, and and maybe we'll just have a whole conversation, just like a, a with, book with club Mark meeting. Twain. Uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court is pretty much the only one I missed. Oh, that's my favorite one. Well, that's a, really? Oh. Ah. <laughs> uh <-huh>. It's <laughs> not my favorite one. <laughs> I was always curious but about that one because I was curious how the time travel was done. Oh, it's really lame. Very, it's literally like the guy falls really asleep sad. under a tree hit on the head. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. It, it is very lame. But otherwise, it's a really, really good book. Um, <laughs> otherwise, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Terry and Anne both have similar questions, and you touched on this a little bit when you were talking about um, the, your, your uh, Muslim friend, but they both want to know, were there times when you felt your life was threatened or you were really uh, in danger, and how did you deal with it? There prison? were several times. There were several times. There was one time when my, when, when my life was in danger be, just because of, of who I was, not, not be, for personal reasons, because there was going to be a race war in, 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 the, in the yard. And uh, since the, 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 the whites were only 20%, of which uh, only about half of them ever went outside anyway, we were a tiny minority. Like one out of 10 guys out in the yard is, 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 was, was a you know, white guy. And, and I had to uh, tape magazines to my body. And uh, I quickly learned that uh, different magazines have different tensile strengths because um, I subscribed to a lot of publications. And my favorite to read 
was David Remnick's New Yorker, but I can't wait to meet him and tell him that he put my life in danger with his cheap paper because the New Yorker will, <laughs> will not stop a knife. Uh, National Geographic will, though. National Geographic has fantastic glossy paper that you tape around your torso, and that way you can, you can survive most organ hits. Uh, you can still get your face slashed, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> National Geographic will save your, your torso, your heart, your lungs, your liver. I think they're going to start using that in their marketing. The yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, so William has a very good question. It's similar to one of my own. Um, do you, do you, he says, do you go back and visit your friends in prison? And I wonder, do you stay in touch with anybody? Um, you talked about a moment ago just leaving and, and knowing you weren't going to see these people anymore. But do you maintain any contact? So what happens is everyone who gets out of prison uh, writes me because they find me on the Internet, Right. And I've, I've met them. I've, I've handed out, um, you know, I don't have a lot of money to hand out, but when, when I, when I've seen people in real trouble, I've done what I could for, for, for people. I gave one guy a briefcase because he claimed he needed it for business. But, um, it, 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 I haven't been back to prison. I don't know what will happen to me. I don't know while I was on parole for five years because after my release from 2014 to 2019, I had five years of parole. Visiting was absolutely impossible. I would be arrested immediately. So those five years kind of erased my, my, my very tight bond with, with, the, with the friends I had left. So for me to visit now, it would, have to, it would be to see people I haven't seen in six years, seven years. So the five years put a really big gap between us. I hope that answers questions. I, I imagine it does. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to invoke host privilege and, and ask uh, one more question of my own, and that is just how how did you get become the writer of this book? How did how, what was that process? Did you well? Uh, how did you, you get a publisher to have faith in you? And well, you have you okay. Have you, have you heard about the, the 10,000 hours? I heard it somewhere that you do anything for 10,000 hours, you become good at it. I used to tell people I was a, a writer. Uh, I used to have business cards that said I'm a lifestyle artist. Uh, I, I, I saw what other writers were like when I was a kid. I wanted to be like them, dress in black, smoke cigarettes, you know, all that. But I had not written anything before prison. I was a big fraud. Uh, but uh, in prison, I spent so much time writing. I wrote an entire novel, then half of another novel. Then uh, I also, uh, someone's an expert at eating candy. I I'm an expert at cooking and, eat and eating too. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, so, so um, you know, I, I, I wrote, I wrote my wife a letter every day the mail went out. So five days out of seven for 10 years, she got a, she got a letter. Every letter had to be two pages. It was, I was strict with myself. I wrote a journal page, yeah. one page a day, and I came home with a stack of journals like this. Uh, so so I practiced my, 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 what I do. So when I got out, my first publication was the story of buying those human souls and how I, I uh, got put into solitary confinement for such a medieval uh, crime such a ridiculous idiotic crime uh and uh, vice magazine published it later on i had a, a column with them i i, I managed about a hundred publications and uh and um uh, an agent picked me up fairly early in the game and sold the book uh quickly to 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 penguin viking uh now it's penguin viking random house all big three together in one uh before they used to be three different companies, but um, I, uh, I I I wrote the, the book for them. It took a long time to get published with, with COVID and with my own my own fault and in, 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 in causing delays. But um, definitely, if you're asking how to become a writer, I mean, I watched my 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 father become a writer. It's definitely through practice. And if you're if you want to be a writer in order to become famous or in order to make money, forget it. You're not going to be a writer. People write because they can't not write. You know. So I, you know, I 
I, I, I have other things that I, I'm, I'm planning on putting out because there's been more to my life except for the prison. You know, I know, like, like Jacques said, the 10 years, it was one third of my life at the time. But I have a little more experience in life that I have some thoughts on that I think would be interesting mm -hmm. to people. Uh, but, you know, let's see how this one does first. I know I just hogged you for well, 40 minutes, but I do have another question, if that's all right. Um, and that, yeah. well, maybe it's not even a question so much, but um, there's a lot of, uh, at the beginning of the book, of you reading to see about prison experience. <laughs> yes, as a guidebook. <laughs> as a guidebook. Yes, and yes. Is and that, is that what you were hoping, to a certain extent, to no. give... The next unfortunate, no. unfortunate uh, Daniel Janice. Of course, such a book would have been a godsend for me. But you mm -hmm. just don't meet that many of these around. Most people uh, who walk at least a few shoot, few steps down my road end up getting saved and sent to rehab before they do something truly stupid. I, uh, I'm just the one who was an extremist enough to actually commit a violent felony. Uh, I didn't meet too many people from my background who could have used such a book. Uh, a lot of the mm -hmm. practical information that's in the book is actually very well known to prisoners, but it's not out there because they're not the most articulate population. You know, I read all, every prison classic. And I have an article coming up, coming out with Publishers Weekly about all the, the prison classics. But, um, you know, like in the belly of the beast, I don't know if you're familiar with that one. That told life what life was like in New York State prisons, the same ones I was I was in. Uh, of course, things change very much with time. Uh, in the belly of the beast is set in the 60s. And at that time, it was perfectly fine to uh, rape men. I mean, in my time, that was I, – I, ne I never saw – uh, uh, an, an act of non-consensual sex happened in prison in 10 years. But in the belly of the beast, it yeah. seems like it's happening every five minutes under the stairs. So apparently things change. And perhaps some of the information that I have, uh, for example, I talk about uh, cans, canned food, how can tops are used as weapons, how a can in a bag is used as a bludgeon, and then the person ate the beans that were inside the can. Uh, I saw all, all, all that. But I think they've switched now. I, as far as I know, commissary in prison no longer sells cans as of last year. They sell pouches, which is a tragedy for prisoners because the pouches cost three to four times as much as the cans. And the prisoners still mm -hmm. make 10, 10 cents an hour. Got it. Um. Jennifer, are you still there? It looks like you're frozen on my screen. But I, I see a lot of frozen, Jennifer. Oh. But uh oh, 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 oh! Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. I was uh, wondering if we should if we should try and close out with showing some of his slides, but uh, well, we'll give I'll it a try. Let's see. Our, our tech, I'm, I'm sorry that our tech has been a little bit rocky tonight, and I can't account for it. But well, let's you're, see you're if we can. Again, so. Oh, okay. Well, that's a good sign. So oh, you stop. Uh, let me see what yeah. I can do about And we do want to thank everyone for their patience with tonight's technical nonsense. I'm, I'm so grateful for the support. You don't know there's people who have been so... Ah, that's me with Umberto Eco when I was 17. Can everyone see? And remind people who Umberto Eco is. Umberto Eco is a great Italian semiotician and, and author. That's me with my parent. Next one was with my parents. See, that's my father and my mother in 2011. So I was already in prison at that point for six years. Uh, really, no, seven years. So that was them coming to visit that, you. Was that a conjugal? Was that a in in one it's of not the a conjugal con spaces? It's not a conjugal. I didn't have sex with my parents. Although there were oh, people in prison who uh, did things like that, but not me. Uh, no, this well, is just I remember the, in the in the chapter on conjugal, you talk about Polaroids. Right, right, right. But the Polaroids were also taken in the visiting rooms, and you could you okay. pay two dollars each for them. I did not mean to imply that you were having unnatural relations. Eh, whatever. All right. Uh, the, <laughs> this this is my wife and I. Um, this is me with all my, my my muscles. I spent the first four years of prison just exercising. As much as I as much as I could to you know 
at least look like I fit in, you know. Um, and I'm much younger here, and she's she's, but she looks exactly the same because she's kind of like a vampire yeah. from Hungary. <laughs> this this is me. See that see that leather weight belt? I paid fifty dollars to get that made. It has the uh, old Imperial Russian eagle on it. Maybe that wouldn't be so popular these days. I still have it. It's it, the, the, I brought the belt home um, as a souvenir, but I don't have the but, body uh, anymore. So, so people know I, there's there there is quite a bit in the book about the bodybuilding, but we didn't have enough time to get into it tonight. But it is very interesting. This is this is uh, my first home when I got out of prison in 2014. So that's my father and my wife. We're in Baltic Street in Brooklyn. And God, was I happy. I was happy to see the sun and happy to see the moon and happy to see the mailman. And everything was just wonderful. When you when, After you've been inside for a little bit, you appreciate small things for, for a long time. That's my, my, my wife and I. That's for me dressed up as a writer. <laughs> well, well like thanks to your book it. wherever you go you're a writer now daniel i i guess so i mean thank you well thank you both so much for a fascinating evening thank you for um this book does, any, and, does anybody have uh, any horrible questions that you've been meaning to ask i mean you know what people always want to ask but they're afraid to ask did you get raped? That's what people always kind of like wonder about. I had no such no such problem. Nobody even um, tried me. I guess I wasn't good looking enough or something. So it's it it wasn't that that wasn't a problem. And I didn't see it as a problem for for other people. I, I you know I did see transgender prisoners, and and I did see some of them having uh, relations with 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 men, but they were consensual. So, um, just just something, just something to to to, to throw in. <laughs> well, thank so, you. thank you for that. Yeah. And and there's so much to uh, yes, Jacques. Uh, Go ahead. Yes, I'm modeling. Me too. We're all modeling. Buy this book. I can't imagine that if uh, we started out this program and you hadn't made up your mind to purchase this book, that you have not yet made up your mind to purchase this book. So follow the link in the chat. Uh, know that you get a signed copy, Daniel signed copies, and know that your purchase benefits the Mark Twain House and Museum. Thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you for a fascinating conversation. Well, thank and you for having me. A stranger, please. Thank you. We'd love to have you again. So next next book, come on back, okay? And, uh, yeah, and you can I'd, talk I'd, again. I'd, I'd love to. It's, it's, it's been wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Daniel, you and are you, our Jack. guest. Uh, please, please come up to the Twain House. We will give you a visit I'd, and send I'd, you I'd home with an annotated Mark Twain Huckleberry Finn. Annotated? Oh, is the, there's no such thing. There is, is there a one? beautifully annotated Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, yes. Oh, I'd love it. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> All right, then. It's a date. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you for you guys. joining us. And, Take and, care. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you both very much. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Sure.